Today on State of Tomorrow, passion for jazz, the brain trust, and the philosopher. The arts and, and humanities are really what we're all about as human beings. I mean, the reason we work hard, the reason we create all these things with math and science, presumably is so that we can have a life. John Adams wrote the first education clause into the uh, Massachusetts Constitution in the late 18th century. He included the arts and poetry. Now, you're talking about a p three million people, a little thin line along the Atlantic seaboard, that could have starved to death on any given day without a broad industrial base. And there is John Adams writing about, you need to understand the humanities and poetry and not just the mechanical sciences and agriculture. Well, I think Adams was making an important statement. If he could make that statement in the late 18th century, I think we can make that statement today. What is jazz? It's a good question. <laughs> it's hard to put into words. I mean, it's improvisation. Relentless energy. It's fun to listen to. There's a feel. There's always something going on. Well, hey, that's kind of cool. It makes you tap your foot. It means something different probably to everyone. Man, if you have to ask. Jazz is the most improvisation friendly form of music. It's like a broader term for improvised music in general. It's a truly American art form. Jazz is a, con is a conversation. It's a part of our culture. It can move your emotions. You don't have to be a musician to understand it. You can, it can still make you tap your foot. I mean, it's always done differently. People improvise on something that was there and, and change it into a personal statement. The more you learn, the more interesting it gets. It's, it's really fun to play. The best description of jazz I could give would probably be it's like uh, there's no rules. Tonight's our fall concert with the school lab band. And we have a guest artist, and this time our guest artist is Wayne Bergeron. A lot of people would say he's the best lead trumpet player who's alive right now. Many of the great players that I work with in Los Angeles came through this program. And I don't know what's in the water here or what they do here exactly, but this band is just another example of a bunch of 20-year-olds that play like a professional band. And everybody gravitates to this place. As a matter of fact, I send students here when I want them to get their butts kicked. If I have a young student that's gonna go to college and he's looking for a place to go, I would recommend he go here. You know, if you go into a school, a small school, where you're the first chair player instantly, what do you learn? Nothing. You come into a place like this where you're not going to be top dog when you walk in. You were top dog in your tent. You're going to come here. You're going to have to get better. Every player that comes through this program that comes to Los Angeles has got the skills required. I come into a situation like this, I learned something from these guys, too. There's some very heavy players in this band. You know, jazz being one of the original American art forms and one of the few <laughs> pieces of our culture that are really ours, I think it's real important for an institution to keep jazz alive so it doesn't die. Why is jazz such a big thing here? Well, the right elements and ingredients came together at the right time. In 1927, North Texas was very conservative. In fact, it was so conservative that enrollment had begun to diminish, and the president of the university was looking for a way to increase enrollment, and he decided to make the university a little more fun place to be. My father was Floyd Graham. He was brought here by North Texas to create a stage band and a Saturday night stage show. The shows generated a tremendous amount of interest among students in big band. 
There was so much interest that the students clamored for a degree program. So here we are in Denton, Texas, at the North Texas State University in 1947, and there they have a degree for political reasons. Instead of calling it a jazz degree, they call it a degree in dance band. In order to hear jazz, you went to places that were not exactly the kind of places you would take your mom to. Uh, and so that probably had a lot to do with the image of jazz. You know, there were delegations from the faculty back in those days that went to the president's office to get this jazz kicked out of here. We don't want it. We want, we want to teach Beethoven, Brahms, Bach, and so forth. Jazz was non-existent at the university level in terms of formal music studies. People began to come here from all over the country to be in that program. The advent of Leon Breeden was when we really hit the big time. And under his guidance, the program went to international fame. When I would have orientation, there'd be seven or 800 students here. It kept growing quite a bit. We ended up, two years, we had 17 big bands. Sooner or later, it became a competitive type of situation where you could only take the best players. You'd hold auditions. There became an upper echelon, and to this day, that is the one o'clock lab band, named for the hour that they meet. Under Leon, the one o'clock, it went on State Department tours. It made the first international tours. I got a, uh, a letter from the White House. Would you be interested in bringing your band up to play for the king and queen of Thailand? They're going to have a state visit here. We played out on the back lawn, and Duke Ellington was there, and he sat in with us. He said, you, you guys have an arrangement of uh, my theme song. No rehearsal. He sat and played with us. He said, I'll look up at you when I want you to bring the band in. So he started playing it in waltz time. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three, two. The band came in and the arrangement was absolutely perfect. It was as if it was written for him. At the end of the evening, right in my ear, he said, after hearing your band, I'm calling a five-hour rehearsal of my band tomorrow. And I said, Mr. Ellington, you don't need to do that. Your band's excellent. He said, oh, those kids just knocked me out. We were in Japan for three weeks, Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, and played for the king. Thank you. What a great audience. In large part, the degree consisted of uh, students writing or arranging music. Well, how do you know if what you wrote down is right? Well, the jazz lab was born, so they'd get students together with that same instrumentation and play it down. For 12 years, the best band here was the 2 o'clock band. I didn't like the idea because at 1 o'clock, the weakest players came in, and, and at the end of 1 o'clock, here'd come these two o'clock giants, these great players, and these little kids would start shaking all over because they didn't want them to hear them missing notes and things. I said, I want to start the day off with the one o'clock and let us set the pattern that we want all the bands to try to reach and it worked beautifully, worked beautifully. Uh, one of the things that we pride ourselves here at this program is to treat the students in a professional manner and as such, they're expected to be ready to play at the downbeat. We don't start at 105. 103, we start at 1 o'clock, and, and the students are, are ready to go. It's exciting. My name is Neil Slater, and I conduct the 1 o'clock lap band. Four days a week, the band's rehearsing. I'm Evan Weiss. This is my third year at UNT. I'm a junior. I play in the 1 o'clock lab band. Today, first in rehearsal, we're going to play a chart that I wrote called Camelback Blues. Pretty much all of my day is 
music between rehearsals, recording sessions, and gigs on the weekends. Most of us here keep really busy pretty much all the time. Playing in the lab band definitely takes some practice. I like to play four or five hours a day. You know, that definitely doesn't happen a good bit of the time, but the more the better. I was deciding to come down here. I applied to a bunch of different schools, uh, some schools in New York and University of Miami. And it kind of came down to either here or University of Miami would, would have been about the same price. I, I would have liked to go to New York too, but if you don't get a scholarship, they're pretty much saying, okay, you can borrow $30,000 a year to go to music school. So I mean, I, I have a hard time justifying that. Rehearsals and performances where you're interacting with other musicians and interacting with the audience is more how I learn how to play music than strict exercises. Yeah, I live right above J&J's right up there. My landlord recently just uh, said that we're not going to be able to play in our place anymore. He said he gets monthly complaints about us, so my roommate and I are looking to move. <laughs> Every year, the one o'clock gets to record an album. We usually go to Dallas and record in a studio down there, and uh, they bring in a recording engineer from New York, and we lay down a full CD's worth of songs. If you write charts for the band, you can get your stuff recorded, and the school pays for it, so that's really nice. Our students learn from being involved with high-level artists like Wayne Bergeron. We get to hang out with them and they find out, what, how'd you do this? Uh, what are your uh, practicing habits? And so this is a learning experience for everybody. I don't get nervous before the performance, usually. Uh, if I'm going to get nervous, it'll be like right before I'm about to play a solo. But you know, hopefully, I think the more you do it, the less, the less nervous you are. So hopefully, I won't get nervous. <laughs> The good thing about, about jazz music is, is that the people that come out to see it are like really into the music. So it's fun to play for an audience that's that big and that appreciative of the music. <laughs> what is jazz? Uh, I would, uh, best description of jazz I could give would probably be it's like uh, there's no good and there's, there's no bad. There's only different. Well, there's a lot of science in music. A is 440 vibrations second, that's physics. <laughs> It's very important, it's the other part of, of everybody's life. It's not only just the academic thing, but it's being able to appreciate the artistic endeavors of others. That's music. It, it, it touches your heart. You feel close to someone that can pick up a piece of metal and make it sing, make it tell you something. Most kids nowadays, they think music comes out of a little box. So when they get exposed to seeing a real orchestra, I mean, you'd be surprised how many people go, wow, that's what that is. They don't realize that that's where that came from, that it doesn't just come out of a little box. When you're listening to live musicians, there's always a human element. You can feel the communication that's going on between those musicians and the audience. And I think the role that the schools play is getting people started. It's sort of what jazz is.